Good afternoon, and thank you for joining the National Conference of State Legislatures and the Pew Charitable Trust for this look at data tools for policymakers and stress testing pension plans. My name is Anna Petrini, and I am a policy specialist in the Strategic Initiatives Program at the National Conference of State Legislatures. I'll be serving as the moderator of today's webinar. Next slide, please. As a reminder, for best results with the audio portion of this webinar, we encourage you to use the unique telephone dial-in information contained in the registration email you received. The National Conference of State Legislatures is pleased to partner with the Pew Charitable Trust to bring this webinar to you. In case you are not familiar with NCSL, we're a bipartisan organization that serves the legislators and legislative staff of the nation's 50 states, its commonwealths, and territories. NCSL provides research, testimony, and opportunities for lawmakers to exchange ideas on pressing state policy issues. NCSL conducts a variety of research related to state retirement systems and state fiscal policy, which we make available on our website. State retirement issues fall primarily within the jurisdiction of one NCSL standing committee, the Committee on Budgets and Revenue. NCSL standing committees allow legislators and legislative staff to exchange state experiences in shaping public policy and managing the legislative institution. They meet twice a year at the NCSL Legislative Summit and the NCSL Capital Forum. For more information on these meetings or NCSL's activities and services to legislators and legislative staff, please visit our website at www.ncsl.org. Next slide. The purpose of this jointly sponsored webinar is to learn about how stress testing and related tools can help policymakers understand, manage, and plan for the risk and cost uncertainty in providing and funding pension benefits. After we hear from our presenters, we'll open the discussion to include questions from the audience. To ask questions, you can simply type one into the Q&A box in the right-hand corner of your screen. Your question will not be visible to everyone, only to the webinar administrators. We will take as many questions as possible within the time we have available. Next slide. Our first speaker today, David Drain, is a senior researcher at Pew and serves as a principal investigator and methodologist on Pew's research agenda on state fiscal health, economic competitiveness, and other state policy issues. He has been a lead researcher on a number of groundbreaking studies looking at state-run public employee retirement systems. In addition to his expertise on public sector retirement benefits, David has conducted research and analysis across the 50 states that inform state policy decisions on a wide range of issues, including state transportation investments, state revenue systems, economic development, and mortgage lending. Next slide. Our next speaker is Eileen Norcross, a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. As director for the Mercatus Center's state and local policy project, she focuses on questions of public finance, and how economic institutions support or hamper economic resiliency and civil society. She specializes in fiscal federalism and institutions, state and local government finance, public sector pensions, public administration, and economic development. She is the lead author of Ranking the State's Fiscal Condition. We look forward to hearing from both of our speakers, and now I'm going to turn the program over to David Drain. Welcome, David. Thank you. Uh, thanks to NCSL for organizing this. Uh, thanks to my co-presenter Eileen for sharing her insights, and thanks to all of you for taking time out of your day to learn about more about this important topic. Uh, next slide. By way of quick introduction, uh, the Pew Charitable Trust is a national nonpartisan nonprofit. Uh, we do work on a number of public policy areas with a focus on uh, state policy issues, and in particular, a look at state and local retirement systems. Uh, this is work we've been doing since 2007 with our first report on the topic, Promises with a Price. And since then, we've continued our research looking at both funding, investments, disclosure, governance, employee preferences, and plan design. Next slide, please. Uh, so why do we care and why do we think uh, state policymakers should care? Well, looking nationally, we see a $1 trillion gap based on states' own reported numbers between what state pension plans should have on hand to pay for the promises made to retirees and workers and what these plans actually do have on hand. Uh, this is a gap that's been growing since 2000, uh, when state pension plans as a whole were fully funded, and over time a combination of recessions, both the dot-com crash and the Great Recession, 
uh, contribution shortfalls from states and unfunded benefit increases have led to this growing gap. Next slide. Of course, that overall picture conceals a tremendous amount of variation. We see states that have managed these liabilities and managed these risks well, from Wisconsin, uh, New York, North Carolina, and Tennessee as examples, where plans are fully funded or close to it. In contrast, we see states like Illinois, um, uh, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Kentucky, which have racked up substantial unfunded liabilities, which are both a burden in terms of budgets, but also um, are challenging for these systems that are depended on by workers and retirees. Next slide. So a big part of the story is risk. You know, we see that two recessions and the policy choices around them led many states to substantial unfunded liabilities. You know, this is particularly important right now uh, with interest rates at historically low levels and uh, the risks being taken on by plans at historically high levels, the potential for unplanned costs is substantial, which will have impact on both the sustainability of these systems and on state budgets. Um, there's ways to reduce risk to a certain degree, and we've seen states take action whether it's increasing contributions and building up um, surpluses and cushions, uh, modifying investment targets um, to take on less risk and uh, investing in safer assets, or making changes to benefit plan design that can share risk um, in different ways between employers and employees. But by and large, there will be risk in any enterprise that extends over decades and relies on investment markets. And so what's important for policymakers is to have tools to understand what this risk looks like, how it can impact the fiscal health of their pensions, and ultimately how it affects uh, the outcomes of state policy on retirement. Um, there's a number of approaches we've seen some states use. Um, Washington State uh, has an office of the state actuary that does stress testing. The California Public Employees Retirement System uh, does its own stress testing report. And uh, a number of states um, have looked at recommendations uh, based on core concepts put in place in the Society of Actuaries Blue Ribbon Panel report uh, looking at a variety of topics on pension funding. Next slide. So as I said, you know, we're looking at pension funds that have taken on historically high levels of risk. And one way to look at it is the gap between what they're assuming they can get in investment markets and what a safe investment might give them. Uh, this looks over time. Um, the orange line is the average assumed rate of return of state pension plans. Uh, you can see that in 1992 is a little above 8%. It's declined over time as uh, states have become, have, have lowered their return assumptions in light of both past performance and future projections but it's still around 7.5%. The blue line is the yield on a 30-year treasury bond, which um, is a proxy for what a safe investment could deliver. And if you look back at uh, 1992, you saw that that was pretty close to the uh, assumed rate of return uh, held by states. And over time, that that's dropped, and the gap between the two has grown uh, substantially. Next slide, please. Um, another way to look at it is to look at whether or not uh, investment returns in state pension plans um, are matching uh, equities. You know, while states invest in a number of things, including uh, bonds, hedge funds, uh, real estate and commodities, and attempt to have a diverse portfolio, but you look in the when you look at the actual outcomes, you see that uh, state pension funds um, are really tracking the S&P uh, uh, 500 pretty closely, with the result being uh, that the uh, the risks you see are uh, in equity markets are being carried over to state pension funds. Next slide, please. So what do policymakers need to know? Um, you know, as I said, this is about tools for policymakers um, that will help them uh, understand things. Well, first, what will things look like if things go as expected? Uh, right now, a policymaker has access to kind of a point in time estimate of uh, the pension funds in her state. But in many cases, they don't know what things will look like if everything goes as planned, if you keep your current policy five years, 10 years, 15 years down the road. So giving baseline projections of the future is really valuable to understand, is current policy sustainable? But then second, uh, what happens if things fall short? Uh, what happens if the actual returns don't meet the, uh, the targets or other assumptions don't hold? And what do those same projections look like then? And lastly, taking that information into account, how much risk is a public pension plan taking on and who bears that risk? And who bears that risk is an important point because in a number of uh, states, we either see various alternative plan designs like hybrid plans uh, that share risk. In other states, uh, we see within the defined benefit framework, uh, a variety of ways of sharing risk with employees, whether it's uh, in Arizona or South Carolina or Wisconsin, employee contributions rising and falling with the funding level of the plan 
or um, in other states, COLA is being dependent on, um, on planned funding. So with all that, there's some key data points. Uh, you know, core concepts one, how much money is coming to the plan from employer and employees over time? What's the funding of the plan, liabilities, assets, and the unfunded liability? Um, and then how much money is coming out of the plan in terms of benefit payments, and what does that look like in terms of cash flow? Next slide. Uh, so this is some sample recommendations. Um, these are, uh, to a large degree, inspired and in, uh, take as a foundation of the work done by the Society of Actuaries Blue Ribbon Panel, but uh, also informed by our conversations with state policymakers and what um, they've described themselves as needing. I'm not going to go into detail on this, but kind of the the core concepts are these are things that as state policymakers, as plan administrators, you can ask of uh, the plan actuaries. These should be relatively straightforward projections based on the work that they already do. Um, and can be included in the annual disclosures, both to inform policymakers as they make decisions, but also to be transparent to key stakeholders, namely the workers and retirees who depend on these systems, as well as uh, the taxpayers paying into them. Next slide. This looks at some of the pictures that we generated, in this case for the state of Virginia, based around uh, these co core concepts. Uh, at the upper left, you see the spread on what employer contributions can be over time based on different return scenarios, with the blue in the middle showing the expected 7% rate of return assumption, uh, the red below or red above showing what how costs might rise if things if returns were just 5%, and uh, below in green, what would happen if you actually got um, even above that 7% target and got 9%. Um, the top right is the baseline scenario. Uh, you can see that over time, employer contributions are expected to go up, and those will in turn help fill in the funding hole facing Virginia. Uh, bottom left is looking at if returns were just 5%, and employer contributions rose to meet that. So even though returns are falling short, the unfunded liability declines because uh, the state and uh, local governments are putting more in to, to meet those needs. Same time, employer contributions are going up substantially. And then bottom right says, well, what happens if returns fall short, but plan sponsors, the state and local governments, uh, don't make those additional contributions? And so employer contributions stay the same, but the unfunded liability spikes upwards. So these are examples of the exhibits and analysis uh, that um, are available to policymakers that have these tools. As said, you know, we're looking for things that could be easily implemented by the plan actuaries, Included in the plan disclosures and made available to policymakers and uh, to the public. Next slide. So, as said, over more than a decade, we've seen a growing funding gap for state pension plans of more than $1 trillion from a combination of investment shortfalls as well as states' own policy choices. Um, this also is at a time when states have moved to riskier, more complex investments first, the uh, switch to equities, and uh, more recently, the switch to alternative investments, private equity, and hedge funds. Um, you know, this really calls for increased transparency, uh, better disclosure about investment performance and outcomes, and also use of stress testing so policymakers can understand the risks and manage that risk and complexity. And so what we're looking at are tools that give necessary data to policymakers that help them understand both what the health of their public pension plans will look like if things go as expected and under scenarios where uh, things are worse than expected. Um, thanks once again for taking the time to learn more about this topic. Um, and um, looking forward to both hearing uh, Eileen's remarks and then for the questions afterwards. Thank you so much. Thank you, David. Um, and just a reminder, we'll take questions at the end of the presentations, but please feel free to ask questions at any time. You can ask a question by entering your query into the questions box in the gray control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. And now over to you, Eileen. Thank you very much, and thank you, David, for that very informative, uh, great pre presentation. I'll start my remarks with a little background on the Mercatus Center. The Mercatus Center at George Mason University is a university-based research center, and our mission is to bridge the gap between academic research and public policy. I've spent the last several years in my own research focused on U.S. public pensions uh, in state and local governments and other public finance questions relating to the states and local governments. Next slide. We just heard about the importance of stress testing and reporting in U.S. public plans. And for the very, I think, obvious reason that after the 2008 recession, it almost seemed like a surprise that the recession had such a negative effect on, on many plans. And 
one thing we can ask is why wasn't it better anticipated? Some plans may indeed have been testing behind the scenes, but I think part of this effort is to make sure that uh, plans are doing this kind of stress testing and are prepared for various shocks that could occur to the, to the pension plan and prepared to, for the policy uh, choices they, they would need to make to ensure the plans are well funded. Next slide. I had the um, honor of sitting on the Virginia Pension Commission this past year, and we have, um, as part of that effort, been given a series of presentations by the Pew uh, Foundation and also by VRS, the Virginia Retirement System. Uh, that's formed the background uh, that, that commission members have been given in order to discuss what in particular is facing Virginia's pension system, the challenges and risks facing uh, the system in terms of funding and um, solvency. And a few things, that, uh, my remarks are really taken in part from the information that both VRS and Pew provided over the course of that year. So I'd like to just start with a little bit of background on VRS. Over a period of about a decade, between 2004 and 2015, Virginia's funding gap, the funding gap in its pension systems, much of it can be explained by 34% um, is due to a lack of funding or uh, inconsistent funding discipline. 37% of that funding gap were due to investment returns being less than expected and 32% were due to changes in the assumed discount rate. So you can see the bulk of that has a lot to do with various factors that are going to affect um, the funding of the plan, some of it not in, in the control of policymakers, such as the investment returns. Next slide. Virginia has made a commitment over the past year or so to increase funding to make sure that they're making that 100% payment to pension systems by 2018. As you may know, states that have not had a firm commitment to making the full arc are in bad straits right now. Illinois, New Jersey, Kentucky, Connecticut had very inconsistent funding policies, and that can, just, that can explain a lot of their, uh, their problem right now. Virginia is also committed to amortizing on a 20-year closed period to be more aggressive about those, uh, you know, those contributions, and, and also to measure and manage cost uncertainty with stress testing. And the key question there are, what are the risks of underfunding? VRS does do stress testing, and I think what, what we achieved on this commission is to strengthen and formalize it and make it more transparent. Next slide. As we just heard from David, why model and measure? Currently, interest rates are at historic lows, and there's a large risk premium between uh, interest rates and the investment returns that plans are assuming, and that gap presents uh, a picture of risk of what the plans may face should returns not materialize. The cost of the pension plans are sensitive to these investment returns. So as we saw after the recession, a decline in your investment returns is going to show up in, in increased costs to the plan. And practically speaking, it's very hard for policymakers to prepare and plan and make the right policy choices, the right funding decisions, the right investment choices and management decisions without a thorough analysis of those risks and costs, the ability to project out into the future and know what the trade-offs might be down the road is really part of just good policy making. As mentioned, Virginia does perform regular stress testing. And we learned, uh, sorry, next slide. We learned on the commission uh, that VRS performs monthly scenario analyses based on Morgan, a Morgan Stanley paper uh, driven by five what they call story analyses. What would happen to Virginia's pension system, uh, let's say due to Brexit and a shock to the market or a change in, in, in the market? Um, they had uh, several cases in which they modeled the effect of, for instance, a, a bear, uh, a U.S. election having a, a bear impact on the market. And, and this is a way of saying, well, if there's an economic shock, what, what is the effect going to be to investments and there, therefore the pension plan? Next slide. As we saw in David's presentation, there are a few elements to stress testing. One is the stress test itself, and, and that models what happens on the investment side. If, there are, if we're assuming, let's say, 7%, what if returns are 2% above, 2% below? And we saw various possibilities there, depending on whether policymakers adjust their contributions or not. Another thing that the commission and, and through the work of Pew 
has, I think, formalized this sensitivity testing, and that looks at the other side of the equation, which is the size of the liability. What happens when you change one risk factor and keep others constant? So here we want to understand the risk of the discount rate. What happens when you increase or decrease that discount rate, and what is the impact on the liability? Next slide. And then as mentioned, the other element of what the Virginia Pension Commission has, has um, moved forward is scenario testing, something that VRS is already doing, which is modeling economic shocks. What if the plan weathers a 15% investment loss in one year, followed by 20 years of 5% returns under an assumption of, um, that the, uh, is, let's say, an expectation of earning 7% a year? So that's just one possible scenario. Next slide. These, plan, these practices are very important. The whole key is to assess the plan's exposure to risk, to prepare uh, for, for what would happen under various scenarios. What happens when the following elements vary? What happens to the pension plan? What happens when the annual contributions are less than the ARC? What happens when there's an inflation change or a change to the COLA, demographic changes, long-term salary changes, changes in longevity? There are many moving pieces in the defined benefit plan that can ultimately have an impact on funding and costs. Next slide. I think the experience on the Virginia Pension Commission has been an extremely productive one, extremely collegial one, uh, and I, I think the combination of Pew and VRS working together to provide the Commission with great information and to respond to questions has been part of that. Throughout the conversations, we discussed current stresses, uh, rather um, VRS's current stress testing practices, and how to take what they're already doing, strengthen it, refine it, advance it, formalize it, make it more transparent. Uh, to the public, and I think that's key because you want to bring the public, you want to bring uh, policymakers, you want to bring employees into the conversation so they're also aware of wh what these forces can do to a pension plan and the kind of choices that policymakers have to make. The information that we were provided with during these meetings was key in giving members of the commission context for the decisions that were ultimately made, the recommendations that were made on plan funding, on plan design and on the reform proposals. Next slide. So the recommendations that were made at the conclusion uh, of 2017 were baseline projections. For, for, for VRS to provide these baseline projections, sensitivity analyses under a range of discount rates, that, that again, getting at the liability portion, stress test analysis on the, on the asset portion, what happens when investment returns are above or below expectations, and scenario analysis, what happens uh, and, and the condition, uh, when there's an economic shock. Next slide. And this has become law. Uh, this is one of the things that the commission agreed on uh, that should be forwarded, and it has been codified as Virginia law. And I think that's it's fantastic. Uh, we also learned at the most recent meeting, next slide, please. At the most recent meeting, we learned just this week that Virginia's actions to codify um, stress testing has inspired New Jersey to potentially do the same. And I think that's, that's just great news, because if, if plans do this, uh, I think they'll avoid some of the problems that they ran into post-recession. They'll be better prepared, better information to make the right choices uh, should plan returns not, um, not return as anticipated. I'm happy to take your questions. Thanks very much, Eileen. Um, yes, at this time, we are happy to take questions from the audience. Um, again, to ask a question, please type it into the Q&A box on the right-hand corner of your screen. And it looks like we've got one for David. Um, we've talked a little bit about Virginia and New Jersey. David, could you elaborate on how um, other states are using these tools? Sure, and I said uh, a couple of the early adopters of this approach were Washington State and uh, the California Public Employee Retirement System. Uh, in Washington State, they have an Office of the State Actuary, which is tasked with, among other things, uh, looking at pension funding and pension data. And they produce a report that looks at not just the in, uh, investment side of it, though that's obviously one of the biggest risk factors facing public pension plans, but uh, a, a range of assumptions, including you know what do what do our new workers look like, and what's their what's revenue growth, and you know what what happened if policies are changed, and uh, 
tweaks are made there. So they look at a broad array of scenarios and uh, assumptions to really kick the tires on each um, and, and really give a broad look on how each matters in terms of the long-term health of the pension system. And then in, in California's case with CalPERS, they've had a fascinating approach where they, they look at the risk of something that they don't want happening happening. So they do kind of a more complicated version of this uh, called stochastic analysis where they, they run many scenarios and see what happens. So for example, they, they wanted to know how, what percent of the time do we end up being less than 50% funded? We've decided we don't want to have that happen. And they, what they saw is that with the risks that they'd taken on um, and their current level of uh, return assumptions, that that was a real possibility in a number of possible features. And so that helped them, inspired them to put into place this slow de-risking uh, approach where rather than make a big shift to how they do things, each time they have better than expected returns, they take a little of that surplus or they take that surplus and use it to, to fund a lowering of the riskiness of their investments, to lower their return assumption um, and to uh, lower the riskiness of their portfolio. And that's been an interesting way of informing policy through these tools. Thank you, David. Um, our next question is for Eileen. Uh, what's wrong with expecting the same return on assets every year? Doesn't it all even out in the end? It would, um, one would think so. Um, the assumption of the same return every year is a very stylized assumption. Certainly we can look to our own personal investments. But we do not get the same return on our investments every year. The problem with assuming, let's say, I use for an example, 8% every year is you're going to get a range of returns over, over time. Let's say you get a range of returns that averages out to eight, let's for the sake of argument, just say it's nine, eight, and seven, three years, averages out to eight. Depending on the sequence of those returns, by year three, you could end up with being funded or underfunded. If you experience um, the low returns uh, towards the end of that sequence, you could end up with less funding than if, the, than, than if it was the reverse. So it's a very a stylized assumption. Uh, there, so there's a necessity to test these systems along more realistic lines. they are not caught, caught off guard with uh, funding gaps. Thank you, Eileen. Um, okay, another question here. Um, would we be able to discuss in a little more detail um, proposed stress testing for general use? Uh, maybe, David, do you want to tackle this one? Sure. Um, so when, you know, obviously some of the things looking at what California and what Washington State have done get really technical really fast. But when we're talking about, you know, some of the recommendations we've made, and for example, what Virginia has done, um, is to try to have, you know, some some key measures that, that tell a story of, of risk. Um, as said, one of the first measures, what's going to happen in the future if just things go as expected, the baseline scenario. This is information that many policymakers don't have in their states. And, you know, if when, when we've been able to produce these exhibits in states, you know, it's often we see surprise that, oh, you know, in 20 years we're still underfunded or in 15 years this is going to happen. Two, the sensitivity analysis. How much uh, do my liabilities go up if I assume a 5% return instead of a 7% return? And that's really an example of kind of the level of risk being taken on. Um, so that's, that gives a, that puts a number beside uh, the riskiness of things. Uh, third, I said the, uh, you know, the actual return scenarios, um, you know, an easy way of saying, well, if we keep our current policies and instead of 7% being the right number, 5% or 6% is the right number, what does that look like? Um, you know, it's a stylized analysis, but it tells a clear story. Um, and then lastly, what happens if you have an investment shock? You know, the Great Recession, you know, is obviously a big part of the story of the unfunded liabilities today, but there are states that were able to, to ride that wave and manage it um, and are well-funded today, and there's others that are uh, in much worse shape. If that happens again, what does that look like? Do you have policies in place that can address it? Thanks very much, David. Um, here's a reminder that copies of the PowerPoint presentations will be available on the um, NCSL website after the webinar. Um, we've got another question for David here. Um, Mr. Drain just mentioned that the virtues, the virtues of stochastic analyses, um, however, their analyses were deterministic. 
Uh, stochastic is a much more robust analysis. Why didn't either presenter recommend the better of the two approaches? That's a great question. And uh, I mean, largely it's attempting to come up with a set of approaches that give give a lot of valuable information that will be easy for plans to ask of their actuaries to implement. Um, so this is trying to create a, you know, a floor of everyone has this very good, very useful information. Uh, stochastic analysis, uh, where you, rather than say, well, what happens if it's 5% returns each and every year, you know, you run many, many scenarios, you know, 1,000, 5,000, 10,000 runs of, of your model and say, you know, I'm going to give it a reasonable set of assumptions and it's going to generate returns. That tells, um, that tells a more useful and more complete story. Um, and we think there's a lot of value in that. You know, what uh, CalPERS and what uh, Washington State are doing uh, use those tools. Um, you know, we do that analysis for a lot of our work. Um, we would certainly, uh, you know, both recommend and, and look to help states interested in implementing stochastic analysis. But I said we wanted something that everyone could ask of their actuary um, and be able to get clear, useful data that would give a more complete picture um, as part of their regular regular analysis and disclosures. I, I just want to add, yeah, thank you for that question. It's a very good one. And I, I, I agree with David's answer. Stochastic analysis would be very valuable. Um, so thank you. OK. Um, either of you are welcome to jump in on this one. What is the right frequency for stress testing, um, given that this should tie back to contribution needs? So if you live in a state whose legislature meets biennially, and has a two-year budget, um, is it every two years? Is that sufficient? Um, and if it's an annual budget or legislative session, then do you do it annually? So I'll, I'll jump in. So when we look, when, when we came up with the recommendations, these were things to be included in um, the, uh, the actuarial evaluation uh, material. Uh, in most states it's done annually, in some states it's done biannually. Uh, but we're looking for things that could be included um, just as a matter of course in the actual disclosures. Um, you know, there's, when we look at most state plans do an additional step, you know, they, look, they do experience studies often every three or five years. Um, that's a great opportunity to do something even more in depth and more robust. Um, but the, the, core, the core pieces uh, should be included in uh, the um, typically annually um, in the actual evaluation. That's right. I, I agree with David. It, it was, it's in the actual valuation, which is done on an annual basis. It's not tied to a bien, biennial cycle. Okay. Um, our next question. Um, with most states, the underfunding um, over many, many years has been a major cause of the situation we are seeing today um, with higher contribution rates and lower funded status. Did you think the legislators were not aware that the underfunding would lead to a problem? I can take a pass at that. That is a very interesting question. Uh, I, I ask it myself. Illinois has had terrible funding discipline for many years. Um, I believe Connecticut is another state. And um, yeah, I mean, I really think that they might convince themselves that it's all going to work out in the end based on perhaps the manipulation of assumptions. Uh, you can see that, I think, in I think it was Governor Edgar's ramp in which they had, had a plan to increase contributions over a period of time, uh, and it seemed to work out on, on paper, but, but not quite. So it is a great question. I, I think they convinced themselves that it's, it's going to be all right in the end. Um, yeah, and just, you know, so one, I mean, part of the reason this is such a great question is when we look at this, all of these questions, it's not whether you pay, it's when you pay. If I push off contributions today, I pay later. Um, you know, if I have an overly optimistic rate of return assumption, I pay less today and I pay later. Um, when you look at a lot of the contribution shortfalls we saw, you know, you, you know, you flash, you know, rewinds to 2000. You had many states with fully funded pension systems. You know, New Jersey is an example. You had uh, states where they had the surplus and they said, well, what can we do with it? Um, we'll find ways to, to raise benefits um, and use that surplus for that. When the dot com crash hit, when funded levels went down, when unfunded liabilities went up and actuarial contributions went up, in some states they made those payments. They said, well, this is, you know, part of offering a defined benefit plan is having uncertain costs. Sometimes they go up and then we make those costs. In other states like New Jersey, like Pennsylvania, like Kentucky, 
um, the response instead was, well, you know, times are tough, budgets are tough, I'm going to push that aside, we'll get to it later. Um, and so the states that did make those uh, full contributions, you know, they had started to catch up by 2007. So when the, doc, uh, when the Great Recession hit, they had a cushion. Uh, states like New Jersey, Kentucky, you know, those, those uh, usual suspects, they had no cushion. And so when the Great Recession hit, um, it pushed things uh, even further down. Another behavior I, I'd add to that, and that's, that's exactly right, is I noticed in, in New Jersey, they had a habit of pension holidays, which is skipping out on the contribution in good times and bad. And I wonder that, about that behavior where, where the pension becomes, it's at the, almost the mercy of the budgetary comfort of, of the sponsor. Um, and that, that's definitely concerning. But yes, it's right to note that after the, during the dot-com years, New Jersey's pension appeared overfunded. And there was this idea that, well, hey, we'll just not make a contribution for a few years. And, and that turned out to be, I think, uh, led to this sort of lack of discipline in, in making the, the funding contributions. Great, thank you both. Um, and maybe this one we can begin with, David. Um, could you please talk about um, trends in current state assumptions related to rate of return, life expectancy, and annual COLAs? Um, oh, great question. So on the first one, you know, the general trend on the rate of return assumptions uh, has been uh, going down. Um, you know, when states have been getting um, experience studies and projections from their investment experts, um, those have tend to suggest that, uh, you know, the 8% returns uh, that many states have assumed were, were higher than could be realized. Uh, we've seen a gradual shift downwards, um, you know, from 8 to 7.75 and, you know, 7.5 to 7.75 to 7.5. So that, those have been declining. Um, you know, obviously there's a lot of discussion and debate about what the uh, the right th right number to land on there is, and there's plenty of controversy, but the general trend has been downwards. On longevity, um, most states that we look at, or most plans that we look at, you know, build in some projections of, you know, people are gonna be living longer over time, that there's gonna be annual increases in longevity. Um, this is, once again, something where there's you know, constant work on, on refining those estimates um, and trying to do better. Um, but, you know, plans do and should be assuming that people will be living longer over time. And then on the COLAs, we've seen a number of states uh, make changes to COLAs uh, to either lower them across the board, um, in some cases lower them until things get, uh, until funding levels improve. Rhode Island is an example of that. Um, to better, more closely tie them with uh, inflation um, or other, you know, you know, or other measures of cost of living. Um, so I think, you know, states have been assuming lower COLAs going forward, largely because states have been restricting the, the COLAs that they've been granting. Okay. Um, and finally, what is the best practice in asset allocation assumptions for stress testing? Do you base it on the system's current allocations, or should it be more generic, like a 60-40 mix or tied to an index? So I think from, from, from our research, our perspective, you know, the, um, I mean, there's strengths of both approaches, um, but when you're, you know, we've, uh, We've looked for ways to try to, to tie it to what the plans are assuming, um, in part because you know sometimes the differences in return assumptions really do reflect differences in portfolios. Um, but um, the um, you know there's I, I don't think there's a clear answer to you know which which one you should land on. Okay, Eileen, any concluding thoughts from you? Um, no, I think that's uh, another great question, um, and I, I think, you know, it'd be good to model plans, at least based on the S&P as sort of a baseline, um, and yeah, you're right, you're right to, to look at that factor because some plans since the recession did move to take on um, much more risk, as mentioned earlier in David's remarks, towards alternative investments and, and greater shares in equity. Um, and, and some some have recognized that that's that's you know not not the way to go. So it's it's a dynamic thing, uh, and it's an interesting part of this discussion. Okay, this brings us to the conclusion of the webinar. Next slide, please.
If you have any questions following this event, please feel free to contact us at the email addresses shown on the screen. Um, a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and will be archived on the NCSL website. Last slide. Um, and finally, please take a moment to share your feedback on this webinar by taking a short survey after it concludes. Thank you very much for your interest and participation today.